repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of this world, of the world, worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sorrow, sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things you have proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And, of course, this 11th verse is speaking of those that had godly sorrow working in them over whatever the issue was with them. It, uh, it really wasn't a, a great sin on their part, but how they dealt with the great sin in the church that, uh, that Paul was dealing with here. Nevertheless, godly sorrow had gripped their hearts. And he made the statement, though, he said, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. And I know for 40 years what godly sorrow is. And I know that for 40 years... I've lived with godly sorrow for things past. I mean, way past, way past. You know, well before the 40 years that godly sorrow got a hold of my heart. And, and I can see that godly sorrow, what it does, you know, in my case, it, it, it talks about it, it, what it works in you. It, all carefulness, clearing of yourselves, indignation, fear, behemoth, desire, zeal, revenge, and so on and so forth, and I'm not going to comment on all of those, and I don't think I've ever wanted revenge for anything, but, uh, but and I don't think that's what it was talking about, but, uh, but godly sorrow has driven me to run this race, to keep this faith, to finish the course. Godly sorrow has done that for me. Praise God, it's kept me in the pulpit continuously, but... Uh, just by way of explanation of what's been happening to me in recent weeks, because over the matter of my daughter's sickness, the sorrow of this world got a hold of me. I mean, it got a hold of me. And notice this, said, the sorrow of this world worketh death. And, you know, uh, I can't explain it. I really can't explain it, but it was like I was a dying man. I saw it in myself, and it had been going on for a long time, and uh, maybe more than other people knew, and then there, there's some very close to me said they could see it. They could see it happening and so forth, but my sorrow over my daughter was so great that... Uh, that, you know, I would have rather it be me than her that was, was on that deathbed. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I couldn't cope with it. I couldn't deal with it. I just couldn't do it. She'd look at me. She'd say, Daddy, help me. And I was so helpless and, and you know, just totally helpless. What do you do in a situation like that? And, uh, but I can tell you this, this morning when I woke up, I barely made it to the, to the, uh, uh, bathroom and I looked in a mirror and I saw myself and oh, what a sight it was that I saw myself. I mean, I mean, weak and without any desire to go on, without any desire even to live and, uh, and, you know, I, and, and, and a great grief and, you know, saw it working in me, but it was working death. It was working death. And I sat there looking at myself in the mirror. What a haggard sight that it was. And I was so weak, I could hardly drag a foot in front of the other. And, uh. But the Spirit of the Lord made it clear to me that you've still, 
I'm 81 years old. You still have a race to run. You still have a faith to keep. You still have a course to finish. Praise God. And I, I don't know if that was a, a, a wake-up call or what, but I made a trip early this morning to see my daughter that I love with all my heart. You know, I mean, my memories of her lifetime, and she's always a special child and, and mature from the time she's three years old, and she thought, and, and, and so on. And, but so many special memories. But I went to tell her that I'm going to see you in heaven regardless of what happens right now. I'm going to see you in heaven. I'm going to see you in that new Jerusalem because I'm going to be coming not too long from now. But I had to make, I don't know, she's in such a condition, I don't know if she hears, if she understands, but I had to say some things. I had to say some things that, that wasn't easy to say, but I had to free myself from the sorrow that was destroying me. I don't know if you can understand that or not, but just I love you with all my heart, but I'm going to see you in heaven. Praise God. I'm coming. I'm coming. And if, if the Lord takes you home, I'll be right behind you just a few years. You know, I'll be right behind you. And I, I had to talk these things out to my daughter. And coming home, I knew, I knew that, uh, praise God, to, to run the race and, and keep the faith and meant getting right back into the pulpit. Praise God. And preaching this gospel. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you. I mean, God gave me a course. And way back, I guess it was 57 years ago now, in 1964, when, when he, I went, entered into the ministry, to actually called me in a vision in 1962. But when I went outside the local church, to preach, and, and actually within a month I was pastoring a little church. But some things that he told me, he gave me a charge. Some things he told me, and, and some of the things that people said, well, God didn't tell you that, but I knew that God had told me that. Praise God. And I still, I have not finished that course that he gave me way back then. That course was, was, was uh, neglected, for some time, fallen after men, fallen after big preachers, fallen after a, a prophet of that day, and uh, and every bit of it ended in disaster, and 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 you know the the record and the history, but I can tell you from the day that godly sorrow ripped my heart, praise God, it's been different. You know, I, I was still searching for the truth that would make them person free from sin inside and it was another another 11 years from the time that godly sorrow had gripped my heart so it's another 11 years before he let me to understand and see that truth in the comparison between the blood of animals and the blood of Christ in Hebrews 9 13 and 14 you all of you probably can quote it by now but if the blood of goats and the bullocks and the ashes of an heifer uh, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, talking about a ceremonial purification of the outer, uh, the outer person, which the law could do, he said, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When I researched and discovered the meaning of that word conscience in that verse, uh, I found out that it meant the innermost thoughts and feelings of the person. I said, oh my God, that's where my problem is. Nothing I'm doing, but it's in my imaginations, my dreams, and so on. You know, the things that the inside where I couldn't wash myself. And I saw that scripture, the blood of Christ could do what animal blood could never do. The blood of Christ was shed to wash us inside 
wash our hearts, wash our spirit, wash our nature inside, praise God, where we could never, ever wash ourselves and where the traditions and the rituals of the church and, and, and the, the sacrifices of animal blood and all those things could do absolutely nothing. And from that time, from that time I've known that I've had a gospel to give to the world and the understanding of it has increased over, over the years. But uh, what the sorrow of the world did for me, I missed more services preaching in the past, I'll say, 30 days than I did in 40 years. You know, just willfully said, I can't get the pulpit. I'm not emotionally able. I'm, I, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And, uh, and, and that, I don't know if it's been four or five services. I don't know. But more than what was for 40 years of ministry, while well, the godly sorrow was doing its work. Praise God, godly sorrow still does its work. But thank God I'm free from the sorrow of this world. I'll see my daughter on the other side. Praise the Lord. I'll see her in heaven. I'll see her in that heavenly Jerusalem. And I stood there looking at that mirror. I said, God, you are just. You are just, and whatever you do, whatever you allow in our lives, you are just. You are just. Praise God. You are just, and he is a just God. Hallelujah. Worthy. Worthy to be praised. Okay, we've got that behind us. Got it behind me. Uh, let's look over to Second Peter. And I believe I was here about, maybe about the last time I preached. I don't know for sure. But uh, I'm going to begin reading uh, at Second Peter, the first chapter, and the 16th verse. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice we, which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. That was in the Mount of Transfiguration where, where in a vision Jesus was with uh, Elijah and Enoch. There before James and John and Peter. He said, This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. Where unto you do well to that you take heed as unto light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, I'm going to stop right there and just pause just for a second. He lets it be known that the more sure word of prophecy is not a voice from heaven. It's not a dream. It's not a vision. It's not a dark sentence, speech as God gives to his uh, watchmen and prophets. That's not the more sure word of prophecy, but the more sure word of prophecy than any experience or, or any such thing that you could ever receive, the more sure word of prophecy is the prophecy of the Scriptures. It's what's written in this Bible. It's, it's what's written. It's a sure word of prophecy. And uh, certainly, certainly many Many different versions of the Bible have been written, you know, in the past uh, hundred years. Hundreds of different versions of the Bible. And there's Bibles today that can say anything, I suppose, that you want to believe. But they're not the sure words of prophecy. They cannot be the sure words of prophecy. The sure word of prophecy is what God spoke to the prophets 
and to the apostles, you know, by the spirit of prophecy, by the spirit of Christ that's abided in them and, and from the Lord himself, what was spoken and what was recorded by them is the sure word of prophecy. And when we come to the, uh, to the, the, the exact saying of the prophets or of the Lord or the apostles, we have that sure word of prophecy. And uh, he said in the 21st verse, finishing off this chapter, he said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And yes, the holy men of God, they saw visions, they had dreams, they received dark uh, speeches from God. But when the Holy Ghost moved upon them, they, they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And what they spake, we were hearing direct from God himself. And this new covenant, we understand that when God pours out his Spirit, there's nine manifestations of the Spirit and the gifts of prophecy and tongues and interpretation and discernment of the spirits and etc. and all of these things. But none of these equal the Scripture. None of these equal the Scripture. But God spake through those holy men of old as the Holy Ghost uh, moved upon them. They spake the words of God. And that's what we have recorded. And the best, the best of the, the, the scriptures, the translations, I hold to be the, the King James Version of the Bible. No question about it. Not even a close second. You know, it's, some people say it's hard to understand, but you get this Bible and you wade through the these and the thous until you can talk in these and thous. Praise God, and you'll understand them, and you'll discover that the Scriptures are very rich and very much alive and very much real. Praise God. But when I was given a charge, when I was 24 years of age, in 1964, when I was leaving the church where I was youth minister in that church, and God had been anointing for two years, after he'd called me to preach in that vision, he began to anoint me. And uh, in a powerful way, I was full of the Holy Ghost from, from uh, 1958. But he spoke to me, and the thing that he spoke to me was, don't study, don't study the doctrines of the church. Don't study the writings of men, speaking specifically of, of, of again, the doctrines of the church and the theologians and and, and the great scholars and so forth. But study the scriptures alone. Study the scriptures. You've heard me tell that many, many different times. Just to study the scriptures alone. And, uh, and he, he told me some more things to do. He, he, he spoke to me. He said, don't preach a theory about healing or casting out devils or miracles. But he said, go and preach the gospel. He, he said, uh, heal the sick, cast out devils, freely be received, freely give. And almost immediately, all these things began to happen in our ministry as we went and began to preach the gospel. And oh my, I could remember how I had to study. Oh, I had to study. I had to come up with three services a week. And, uh, and man, did I study. And more than that, I had two services a week at a rescue mission downtown on Franklin Avenue. And, uh, and I had to study. I had to dig. I really had to dig to get something to preach. But I also discovered something else. That if I had 30 minutes to prepare to preach, if I went somewhere and they said, Brother Surface, Brother Leroy, will you preach for us tonight? If I had 30 minutes to prepare, I needed 25 of those in secret prayer someplace in some corner in some back room 
of that church. I need to get alone with God for 25 minutes because that word that was hidden in my heart through study, praise God, he promised that the Holy Ghost would bring it to my remembrance. And I knew that when the Holy Ghost was upon me, I always had a message. Always had a message when the Holy Ghost was upon me. And, uh, but these are things that I discovered very early on in the Scriptures. But I want to speak about that uh, more sure word of prophecy and the fact that he said that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, it meant what they said. And it said what they meant, you know. You know, I, I, uh, I, I've told people, maybe, maybe children growing up, you know, raising children, but I said, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. Praise God. Are you that way? Are you that way? Do you mean what you say and say what you mean? Praise God. And uh, uh, Ariana understands that. I, I, I don't know if she's talking about her and Reese or she's talking about Kathy and Ariana. I don't know. But uh, praise God. But, uh, but, but that's exactly, I mean, what they said is what this means. It's not open for interpretation. The scriptures are not open for interpretation. Uh, uh, one of our ministers was, was uh, preaching and somebody contended with them. And, and they said, but, but the Bible says, and they was, was quoting exactly what the scripture said. And this person said, but that's just your interpretation. And it wasn't an interpretation. It was exactly word for word what the Scripture said. And the Scripture says this Scripture is not, no Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, if the Scripture says uh, over in John, John, uh, 1 John, the third chapter, he, it's a theme throughout the, that the, the third chapter of First John, that the child of God does not commit sin. It's a theme. First John 3, 5 and 6, we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. How do you interpret that? You interpret that, to, that Christ was incarnate. He became a man that you could see, flesh and blood. To, for what purpose? To take away our sins. John the Baptist knew that. He knew it because of the prophecies of the Scriptures. He could go back to Daniel and know that he was come to make an end of sins. He could say, this is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. How do you interpret that? Uh, I tell you, men interpret it by saying he took away the guilt of sin. That's not what it said. Take away the Shame of sin, that's not what it said. Take away the stain of sin, that's not what it said. It, it, you know, take away the punishment for sin, it's not what it said. Take away the penalty of sin, that's not what it said. It said, he's the lamb that taketh away the sin, the sin, the sin of the world. And when you see that definite article, the, in front of that word sin, you know, it's not talking about a bunch of things that you and I did, but it's talking about that nature that caused us to do the thing that we did. And by this, he taketh away the sin of the world. He takes away that sin which entered into the world through Adam's disobedience. That was a sin nature. Praise God. Now, I believe I, I, this is something that I believe, you know, and I, 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 I teach, but I'll always tell you, it, it's what I believe, that the sin nature is the nature of the serpent. When they disobeyed God, they obeyed the serpent. When they, when they refused the word of God, they submitted themselves to the serpent, and they received his nature. And that's sin, that's what sin is. It's the nature of the serpent. That's the reason that that John can say in First uh, John, the third chapter again, he can say, whosoever committed sin is of the devil. He's of the devil. Boy, that's a powerful saying. 
But he says, talking about Christ manifested to take away our sins. He said, in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And, and religion wants to interpret these things. Put their spin on it and tell you what John really meant to say. But I'm going to tell you something. John said exactly what he meant. And he meant exactly what he said. And it's recorded. We have it here in the scriptures. Now, in, in, the, uh, in the scriptures... In the scriptures, or in the history of the church, the church, within 300 years, because of false teachers and such, entered into, uh, actually, we, we speak about a thousand years of dark ages, actually, is about 1,200 years of, of darkness over the church, about 1,200 years, because the uh, church, by three, before by, by the be the fourth century, the, you know, three twenty five was when the, the first big council was held. But the church was already under the authority of Constantine, the Roman emperor, and uh, it was no longer it was no longer a, a, that organism that Christ that Christ gave birth to, but it was very much an organization, and it was it was very much believing. Uh, much heretical things by this time. And, uh, and for a thousand to twelve hundred years, the church was, was uh, under the authority uh, of the Pope. And, uh, and the Pope was declared to be infallible. One of the Popes said the fastest way to hell is to disobey one word that falls out of my mouth. And, uh, and what, what a horrible thing, but he was establishing his infallibility. If he said it, it had to be right. And uh, boy, I'm telling you, if that's the truth, what a mess we're in today. You know, with this modern pope we've got today. I mean, approval of LGBT community and, and, uh, and, and approval of uh, the president promoting uh, 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 abortion and, and all this, even the Underlings in the Catholic Church are trying to censure the president and, and the Pope sends word, don't do it. Don't do it. We don't know what the end of that will be. But if that's an infallible voice, my, my, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. But you see, it's the scriptures. It's the scriptures. And when the, the uh, uh, Reformation came, and that's Martin Luther, uh, brought the Reformation and he's the one that uh, brought the understanding of justification by faith. But Martin Luther, uh, he came up with some other things. And one of them is a Greek, I mean a, a Latin term. It's sola scriptura. Sola scripture, which simply means scripture alone. Scripture alone. And actually there were five solas that Martin Luther taught in his day. And I agree with them, I believe, as Luther taught them, but not as they're taught today, in, in you know, 500 years later. But nevertheless, he, had, uh, he said, by Scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, and the glory to God alone. And he's speaking of our salvation. He's speaking of our salvation and to me, this is wonderful. What I read here is wonderful, that our salvation is by Scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, the glory to God alone for our salvation. Precious Savior, that's such a wonderful thing. And uh, I, 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 wrote, I wrote this in a, in a, in a booklet, book that I'm writing, and, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read just a, a little over a paragraph out of that book that I wrote. Rather than believe the record that God gave in the Scriptures, the modern church 
has chosen to believe what several medieval teachers and religious scholars taught. That's, that's those that came right out of the Dark Ages, medieval, you know, in the uh, Renaissance and so forth. And uh, many medieval teachers believed truth could be received from observing nature and studying philosophy as well as from the scriptures. Martin Luther broke from this tradition in what he called sola scriptura, which means by scripture alone. In fact, Luther pointed out five solas, which are well worth mentioning, by scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, the glory to God alone. I agree 100% with Luther concerning these five truths, but the question I set forth is, is what is the end result of these five solas? What is salvation? What is grace? Much of the modern church believes grace is a covering for sin, that grace is given to take sinners to heaven. That brings us to the question, what is salvation? The angel Gabriel told Joseph before Jesus was born to Mary, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Gabriel also told the prophet Daniel of Christ's coming, into the world to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. John the Baptist announced Jesus to all Judea, said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. If we're to agree with Luther, concerning by Scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone, and glory to God alone, we must understand that the product of these is a new creation, man or woman, who is crucified with Christ, freed from sin, and created in Christ Jesus in the image and likeness of God. We cannot save ourselves from sin. We cannot make ourselves pure within. This is why Christ died and what salvation is. Luther was correct in telling us the method which was justification by faith, but he never understood or revealed the result of such salvation. This matter of where does truth come from, and in this we believe sola scriptura. In fact, we believe something a little bit stronger, which is called solo scriptura. Because over the years after Luther, sola scriptura means that we believe that the scripture is the source of all truth, but uh, the traditions and the oral, uh, uh, the oral tradition and, and the, 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 uh, uh, all the different uh, uh, meetings, of councils and so on, you know, and, and, and it's got to be understood got to be understood by, by somebody telling us what it means. So sola scriptura has been diluted to, to mean that it's the scriptures alone as being interpreted by the tradition of the church and the scholars and so forth. And that, that's, that's, that's not true. That's right back to where the Catholic church was, that you don't understand the scriptures. You need us to tell you what the scriptures means. But solo scriptural, mean it means the same thing as sola scripture, but it's truly scripture alone. And when God spoke to me when I first entered the ministry to study, don't study the doctrines of the church. Study the scriptures only. He's letting me to know. I didn't even know the term. I didn't know any of these things But he's let me to know that all I needed was the Scripture as it was spoken by the Holy Ghost and as it was given through the prophets and through the apostles. Praise God. That's all that I would need. And as I studied the Scriptures just that way, oh my, Keith wrote a message here a while back titled God's Self-Sacrifice. A prisoner theologian got a hold of it. He's a prisoner that calls himself reverend. 
and uh, in prison. I don't know what he did to be in prison, but he got mad as a hornet. He wrote me a four-page letter. I mean, chewing me up and down and telling me how false and phony I was and, and, uh, and thought I was the only one that had the truth and so forth. And I didn't even write the message. He did. So I determined, well, I'm not going to take this by myself. I got him over to the office or something, and I said, here it is. You got me in trouble. I want you to read this. He read about half a page and to the trash can, you know, <laughs> where it belonged. But, uh, but you know, uh, over the years, over the years as just a young minister, and uh, people would tell me in my revivals and where I went, said, Brother Surface, said, what you preach is just a little bit different, just a little bit different than what other preachers preach. preach. Well, just let me study long enough, and it'll be a whole lot different. You know, but the difference, you know, 30 years ago when God revealed the truth to me and my wife and Pastor Keith can confirm this to you, but when he, when he revealed the truth to me, I searched the scriptures trying to prove I was wrong. You know, I've never searched the scriptures trying to prove I was right. You know, that could get you in trouble. That can really get you in trouble. If it can be proven by the scriptures that I'm wrong, I want to know it. I want to know it. And I searched the scriptures and over and over to prove I was wrong. And the more I searched, the more that I knew that what I saw was right. And every time somebody would come along and make a charge, oh, Brother Surf, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. It'd throw me right back into that thing, searching the Scriptures, searching the Scriptures, searching the Scriptures, because I didn't want to be wrong. I just didn't want to be wrong. And the more I searched the Scriptures, I knew. I knew that Christ shed His blood to wash us from our sins in His own precious blood. I knew that He was manifested to take away our sins. I knew that in Him is no sin. Those that abide in Him sin not. I came to know that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And I knew that those who interpret these things to say, we don't practice sin. It's not our habitual practice to sin. That's a loophole for their own sin and their own failure in this. And yet, if I trusted myself to keep me, if I trusted my willpower to keep me, I will fail. I will fail. The Lord Jesus Christ is our keeper. Praise God. If we keep ourselves in Him, precious Savior, keep ourselves in Him and He keeps us. From falling, the scripture says. You look up that Greek word falling, and it says, from sinning. Keeps us from sinning. Precious. Oh, it's a wonderful gospel. It's a wonderful gospel. But tradition, what, where truth comes from, we, like I say, we believe that scripture alone. Now, I'm not talking about truth about, as far as uh, a cure for COVID. I'm talking about truth as far as... Uh, as a new uh, military weapon or anything like that. I mean, if everybody believed the Scripture, you wouldn't need none of the other. But, uh, you know, that there's things, mathematical truth, you know, outside the Scriptures, and I learned that in a math class. You know, but, uh, but the truth concerning salvation is in the Scripture alone. It's not in philosophy. And, and yet, yet the old teachers, many of them that the church study after from the medieval times, from even before Luther and then after Luther, but many of them believed that there are three sources of truth. That one, the first source of truth was from nature itself. The second source of truth was from uh, uh, philosophy. You know, 
I've got a book on philosophy over there at the house somewhere that will tell you it's a long, long uh, rigmarole of how to prove that we exist. You know? And I said from the start, I can pinch myself. I hurt, therefore I exist. <laughs> but they go through all of this philosophy trying to prove whether we exist or not. I can remember as a child, as a child, uh, one of my friends from junior high school would come home, spend a weekend with me. We'd lay up in bed at night and say, do we really exist or maybe we're just part of somebody's dream and when they wake up, we're going to poof. You know? And uh, that was childish thinking. That's childish. Do you know that's how philosophers think? That's how so many of the philosophers think. My, you ought to hear the philosophers uh, uh, thinking on, on, uh, on how the earth was created. You know, and how we have the seasons. And, and uh, one of the philosophers, one of the famous philosophers, he explained the seasons of earth. He said because the earth was riding on the back of a giant elephant that was standing on the back of a giant turtle. As that turtle walked, you know, the elephant would weave back and forth. And that gave us the seasons. <laughs> you know, that why the sun explained why the sun went south in the winter and the, as a slow turtle, wasn't it? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you say, brother, that's absolutely ridiculous. One of the most famous thinkers of all time came up with that. You know, that was his, his philosophy uh, for, for the seasons and the, the summer, spring, winter, and so forth, and, and, uh, and so forth. But they believed that out of philosophy and out of, out of nature. Now, Paul told us, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world and after the traditions of men and not after Christ. They'll give you philosophy as an answer, but they'll never give you Jesus Christ as a total answer for anything. And, uh, and yet, most of the church, you turn on, I'm going to tell you something, you turn on uh, family radio, it's a local station here, gospel station, you turn it on uh, most of the time between the early morning and noon, and all you're going to hear is philosophy. I mean, I'm not naming out any one person. I don't know all of them there. There might be some good preachers in there somewhere. But you hear these talkers, you know, they're giving nothing but philosophy. Absolutely nothing but philosophy. It'll poison you if you believe it. It'll absolutely poison you if you believe it. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, philosophy, he said, it'll destroy you, it'll strip you, it'll rob you. Philosophy. The other thing that they believed... Uh, was a source of truth, was nature. That you could learn truth from studying nature. And they took it from an interpretation of the Scriptures. Let's go to Romans, the first chapter. I don't know if you're interested in these things or not, but it's what I've got tonight. So, praise God. Uh, Paul said, Romans 1, it's, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And really, that word righteousness is just as properly translated justice as it is righteous. It's the Greek word, the definition is equity of character or act. When it's speaking of equity of character, it's righteousness. But when it speaks of equity of act, it's justice. And God is righteous, and everything He does is justice. He's a just God. He's a righteous God. But He said, in the gospel is the justice of God revealed. And why do I call it the justice of God? Because in the gospel is the justice of God revealed to save sinners. 
The justice of God is not uh, wrath. It's not eternal judgment. The justice of God is not uh, stepping on the sinner to destroy the sinner. The justice of God saves sinners. Praise God. That's, that's so important. I mean, it's so wonderful and glorious to know that without the justice of God, I would be lost and in hell tonight. But for the justice of God, hallelujah. But he said, he said, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, do you know how the religious theologian believes this few scriptures I've read here? The religious theologian to this day will teach that the first chapter of Romans is to prove that the heathen nations are without excuse. Now you think about this just a minute. That somebody that's never heard the name of Jesus is without excuse. That somebody that's never heard of a Savior is without excuse. You know, that somebody that don't even know that there's a God in heaven and say they're without excuse. Well, why does the philosopher say that he's without excuse? Because he can see, he can see the things of creation that are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in Godhead, so that they're without excuse. That if they can see the grass and the green trees and the sun and the moon and the stars, that they've got to know that there's a creator because there's a creation. Oh my. And if they know that there's a creation, there must be a creator. One of the sayings is, if you're walking along a beach on a desert island, you don't know if anybody's ever been there before, but suddenly you kick something up from the sand and you find that it's a, a watch, a delicate piece of watch work. And what can you know from finding that watch in the sands of that beach? First, you can know somebody else has been there. But the lesson that they give out of this is you know that if there's a watch, there's got to be a watchmaker. They don't tell you nothing about the watchmaker. Was it a man or woman? Was he young or old? Don't tell you nothing about him. But if there's a watch, you know there's a watchmaker. That's the philosophy that, that they follow. You know, that not the doctrine of the church. The first time I read this, this first chapter, well, you know, after, after having been studying the Scriptures for a period of time, I read it and I understood I read in the 23rd verse, 22nd verse, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And the philosophy will show you how that the heathen nations thought they were wise, but they're really fools and they created idols to worship and so on. But I read this, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and to birds and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And I read this, but you see, I knew another scripture. I knew no scripture, the prophecy of the scripture, is of any private interpretation and this was a private interpretation that says that's a heathen. Because I knew just as a young man, I remember, I've read that somewhere. 
I've read that somewhere. And in Psalms 106, it says, They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus, they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. Oh, my. And he was talking about the children of Israel. He was talking about the children of Israel in this first chapter. It can be no other way. He, when he said, he said, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, the men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Only, only the children of Israel had a truth that they held in unrighteousness. Only they had it. Only they knew the story of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because the scriptures were given to that nation and to that people. Praise God. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are were not made of things uh, which are seen. By faith we understand. We know how the earth was created because we believe the record. God revealed the record through His prophets. And this probably through Moses to the children of Israel. But we believe the record. We believe the record. And we know in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Oh my, that destroys every thought of evolution and every thought of, of every other imagination of creation that's ever came down the line. But it was God's chosen people that became fools and changed their glory into an uncorruptible, into a corrupt image like to a corrupt old man. God gave them up to uncleanness and they changed the truth of God into a lie and worship served the creature more than the creator and God gave them up to vile affections. You can go read the history of the children of Israel and find that the Sodomites became priest, uh, uh, temple priests and built, built their houses adjoining the temple in Jerusalem where they offered sacrifice to Asheroth and, 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 and uh, the, the female goddesses, the homosexual priest that came into Jerusalem to the temple in that day. Oh my, we're reliving that today. We're reliving that today. The churches, denominations, organizations uh, actually, actually ordaining uh, transvestites as high positions in their churches and so on. And what a horrible thing it is. But why is it happening? Because long ago, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into a corruptible image. And they changed the truth of God into a lie. And God gave them up to uncleanness, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And He gave them up to vile affections. That's where homosexualism and LGBT community comes from. Don't tell me that they were made that way by God. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. They're made. They're not born that way. But they are made that way. And, and oh, I, I had experiences about an eight-year-old that I don't even talk about because they tried to make one of me. They tried. I was, I was assaulted by a stranger, a total stranger, when he was about eight years of age. Thank God he wasn't violent, and thank God he didn't force himself or me to do what he wanted me to do. And thank God I had it up of mom and dad's conscience that they gave me that I would not do, could not do what he wanted me to do to him. There's a horrible thing, and my own children may not even know about that. But I know how they make them. I know how that they form them, how they get their spirit into a young child and destroy that young child. 
oh my, it's a, it's a horrible thing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, praise God. Hallelujah. Where am I? <laughs> Precious Savior. Precious Savior. Glory to God. Uh, Precious Lord Jesus, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Precious Lord Jesus, no private interpretation, no private interpretation, Scripture only, Scripture only, precious Savior. I'm going to tell you something. If you'll take this King James version of the Bible, and if you'll get a, an original uh, Strong's Concordance to study, if there's a word you don't understand in this King James version of the Bible, if you'll look that word up in an original Strong's Concordance, not every Strong's Concordance is faithful and true. They stole his name and they made one that is called the strongest strongs ever, and it's a lie. It's an absolute fraud. It brings all the modern theology into it. You know, so don't ever get what's called the strongest strongs ever. But, but get an original strongs concordance and study the languages. And I promise you, if you will believe exactly what the Scripture says... Scripture alone, Scripture alone, Scripture alone, Scripture alone. You don't have to have me to tell you if you will do those things. I told one brother, I said, are you reading those books I'm sending to you? He's a minister and a man of God. He said, I'll look through one occasionally, but he said, I want God to reveal it to me like he revealed it to you. If you got 40 years, he might do it. <laughs> you know, or you're so much brighter than me, maybe you can get it in 20 years. <laughs> but I said, if you if you'll study the scriptures in the light of what's in those bold, hold the lamb books, you know, and see that the scripture says exactly the same thing, you know, in a few months' time, You'll know that truth that makes you free. And I stand by that. I stand by that. Praise God. I stand by that. You can go free. doesn't matter who you are, what you are. Precious Savior. And when the light of it shines into your heart, praise God, you'll be rejoicing. Oh, how you'll be rejoicing when the light of it shines into your heart. Precious Savior, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to talk about the false teachers and the false prophets tonight. But, but to confirm this, Scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians uh, 2, hallelujah, come on Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved, grace alone, scripture alone. Faith alone, grace alone, by grace are you saved. We need to understand what grace is. We must understand what grace is. If we're saved by grace alone, grace is not a light-hearted attitude towards sin on the part of God. The only definition of grace that I was ever taught, even in a Pentecostal setting and in a, a, a very, very firm 
and I think solid family. But in the churches, I tell you, the only definition I ever knew was unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. That we go to heaven because of unmerited favor. No, we're saved by unmerited favor. We don't go to heaven by unmerited favor. Can you follow me just a little bit here? By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. What is salvation? If you're to understand uh, grace, you must understand salvation. And this, the uh, angel Gabriel told Joseph, said, you'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. There's salvation. There's what salvation is. Saved from sin. Not in sin. Not saved to sin. But saved from sin. Praise God. That he took our sin away. Not the guilt. Not the penalty. Not the punishment. Not the shame. Not the stain. The sin itself. He took the sin away. Praise God.